Okay, can you hear me? Great. <laughs> I will keep this short since I'm the last speaker before lunch. I did with my PhD with Ted, finishing nearly 20 years ago. After that, I spent more than a decade in industry before starting a faculty position in the computer science department at Stanford about eight years ago. And I'm gonna tell you about how working with Ted has proven incredibly useful to me ever since, despite the fact that I've worked in what are nominally completely different areas. Let me start with just a couple of very quick snapshots of two recent projects. So the first one involves RNA structure prediction by machine learning. You probably learned in some introductory biology class that DNA codes for RNA, RNA codes for protein, and proteins fold up into well-defined shapes. It turns out that the vast majority of RNAs in humans don't code for proteins, and it turns out that nearly all of them fold into well-defined shapes and carry out all sorts of functions in the cell. And in the last few years, they've become of increasing, of great and ever-increasing interest in all sorts of applications, including drug discovery. There's a big problem, though, which is it's really hard to figure out the structures of the RNAs. It's harder to determine them experimentally. It's harder to determine RNA structures, much harder than protein structures. And it turns out to be harder computationally also. Part of the reason it's harder computationally is that there's just a lot less experimental data to work with, to learn from. You know, but of course, <laughs> the fact that, we, that it's hard to get these structures experimentally makes it even more desirable to predict them computationally. So in a nutshell, we came up with a method that predicts RNA structures given very little data to train on. <laughs> Actually, in this paper, which to my surprise, appear on the cover of Science in the same month that DeepMind's AlphaFold appeared on the cover of Nature. <laughs> we trained a method using structures of 18 RNAs and no other information. End-to-end -end learning starting with just the positions and element types of the atoms. Second project, as you know, most drugs have side effects. Sometimes they're just annoying. Sometimes they're lethal. Opioids are the best painkillers available. But they have this annoying side effect that if you take a little too much, they make you stop breathing. And that's why so many people die of overdoses. So this project, we were focused on how is it possible to tune drugs so that they will still have the desired effects. In fact, ideally have even more of the desired effects but without the side effects that normally, <laughs> that normally come with them. And here we use a very different approach. It's not machine learning. It is atomic level physics-based simulations. Basically using physics to calculate the forces the atoms exert on one another and then Newtonian mechanics, roughly speaking, to propagate these motions. Now, <laughs> clear question is, what does this have to do with the work I did with Ted? My thesis work was on material recognition. Given an image of an object, how do you recognize what material it's made of? So the short answer is, in terms of the topics I'm working on now, there's very little connection. And in fact, in between an in industry, I spent a lot of time on computer chip design, which was <laughs> yet another area with very little connection. Yet I've been surprised over the last 20 years repeatedly by how much, how much things I learned from working with Ted have proven incredibly useful. Of course, there are some technical connections. My thesis work, in my thesis work on material recognition, I ended up doing most of it with machine learning, and I'm using machine learning now too. But honestly, most of the, the, things that have, the things that have proven most valuable to me are things that are not related to specific technical areas. I was really inspired and continue to be inspired by Ted's courage in pursuing problems that 
others aren't even really thinking about yet. And, co and, and <laughs> combining research from different fields when others aren't doing that. There are all sorts of pearls of wisdom that Ted shared with me <laughs> that I still think about today. For example, Ted told me once at a conference, you should really go talk to your competitors because it's much harder to be mean to someone that you know personally. <laughs> Ted even taught me how to tell a joke during a talk. But probably the single thing I learned from most involves the importance of, importance of communicating effectively with people with completely different backgrounds. Honestly, the hardest part of my PhD was that I had two advisors, Ted and Alan Welsky. I feel incredibly lucky to have worked with both of them. They remain two of the, clearly two of the best people I've ever worked with, and at this point that includes at least four Nobel laureates. But they had complete, well, very different backgrounds and completely different styles. Ted would look over my papers, he would comment on the images, incredibly insightful comments, and he would tell me, of course, I didn't look at the equations. And Alan, it was the other way around. All the comments were about the equations. <laughs> he didn't look at the images. But it wasn't just that. They, <laughs> they would often give me opposite suggestions, and when I tried to get, to get them together for a meeting, that proved pretty much impossible. It was hard during my PhD. <laughs> Fortunately, I convinced Bill Freeman to be on my committee, even though he was not at MIT at the time, and he was able to communicate with both. But in retrospect, that turned out to be one of the most valuable experiences of my career. I now feel like probably the most valuable thing I've brought to, to my projects has been the ability to communicate with, with different types of people and bring them together and get them to work together effectively in a group. So when I was in industry, that was a combination of computer chip designers, algorithm people, and computational chemists. Now it's a mix of many computationalists and various types of experimentalists, biochemists, pharmacologists, structural biologists. And well, <laughs> it's like, I really feel like this is now my biggest strength. And then finally, I realized recently that working with Ted has even informed my approach to parenting. Whatever my daughter or my son tell me, oh, I need to do this because otherwise my friends will think I'm weird. I tell them, you know, I'm really weird and I'm proud of that. <laughs> and I started thinking about this during grad school. In particular, Ted and I shared a hotel room at a conference because he had waited until the last minute to book a hotel room and they were, they were all taken. And the first night he saw me moving this sheet of blanket to the floor and he asked, Ron, why are you doing that? And I said, well, you know, I think this bed is too soft. I would rather sleep on the floor. And Ted said, that's weird. But he said it in a completely matter of fact, non-judgmental way. And I thought about it and said, yeah, it is weird. But it's fine. And then I thought, you know, there are lots of things that are unusual about Ted. He's weird too. And those things are exactly what I admire about him. And since then, I've realized that, you know, lots and lots of things I do are weird. I'm really proud of that. So Ted, thank you for teaching me that I'm weird and that that's good. And thank you for everything else you taught me. Any questions for Ron? Let's uh, thank him again. And for lunch, uh, we start again at 1.30. Thanks.